When it comes to improving your overall health, especially your mental health, everybody knows if you improve your sleep, your diet, and your exercise, or if you start to become active, it'll work phenomenally. But which of those three is gonna give you the biggest impact in the shortest period of time? Believe it or not, it's sleep. That's right. If you fix your sleep before diet and activity, you'll get the biggest impact. You'll get the biz biggest positive impact you can get. So if you have to choose between the three, focus on sleep. Do you think that's because sleep is that impactful standing alone? Or do you think that's because it's so widely neglected that it, it, it gives the greatest potential for improvement in health? All three are terrible for the average person. So they're all in that category. But of those three, poor diet, inactivity, poor sleep, I'll ask this question. Which one will cause you to go crazy or mental or yeah. give you poor health faster yeah. if, you completely if you completely neglect one of them, right? Let's say you eat complete garbage over the next two weeks or you just lay in a hospital bed for the next two weeks or you miss sleep completely. You won't last two weeks. In fact, you'll, you'll it'll be much shorter. You'll get mental illness within a three-day period and uh, your chance of death goes through the roof. That's how big of a, of a deal sleep is. And it just gives you that the the biggest impact. In fact, there was a study on uh, natural methods or interventions on mental health. All three, of course, was the best, right? If you did all three, you just saw these huge improvements. But sleep beat the other ones by far. So from like an adaptation perspective, that's like one of those you can't just like uh, – really adapt to like if you're going to scale down in terms of sleep like i mean you can make it work but it's never really like beneficial for you in terms of like if you're at a point where you're getting x amount of exercise and movement like your body's going to adjust and adapt to its environment yeah. a little bit more like nutrition you know like there might be some uh play there but there's really no play in terms of sleep Dude, totally like if you took somebody the average person the average person has suboptimal sleep, suboptimal diet, suboptimal activity. And let's say you gave them a perfect workout the first day for them, right? Or the perfect diet for them that day, or you give them the perfect night of sleep that night for the first time. Imagine how they'll feel the day after with just each of those, right? The sleep is going to make them feel the biggest impact. Well, because too, I mean, your immune system's affected. Everything. Like, I mean, yeah, your whole, all of your systems are yeah. affected. Yeah. The other thing to consider too is like evolutionarily speaking, um, we, if our, if evolution could have figured out a way for us to not sleep, it would have by now. I mean, for all intents and purposes, you're unconscious. Yeah. You're not building shelter. It's weird that hunting. we need it. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it, you know, it's, you're, it's a terrible state to be in for predators, for productivity, for everything. And yet we still have to do it. So evolution over millions and millions of years, hasn't figured out how to get rid of sleep for pretty much every animal. And that's because it's so important. It's required. We need it. We absolutely need it. That's how big of a deal it is. And it's of those three, when someone's trying to improve their health, it's usually the last thing that people focus on. Now, mm -hmm. would you say though, exercise has the greatest potential to continually give you more, more results or more positive? Yes. So, cause like- Yeah, long like, term, yes. Right, cause you imagine like, okay, let's say you, you have someone and the first thing you could immediately impact their health, let's look at sleep- you're all over the board. Let's put a sleep routine in. Let's let's get that all figured out. Let's yep. actually make they can make a conscious effort. Okay, let's say over a course of a month's time, you you dial it in, and now you're getting epic sleep, the yeah. best sleep of your life. And now let's just say hypothetically, going forward, you consistently hit that. At some point, you, you yeah, it's gonna peak, cap. Yeah, yeah you cap out on what that is giving you in return, yep, and you're right. getting the most out, which is so important, of course. But what's cool about exercise is you know, although sleep takes uh, the progress just keeps going yeah the yeah you know you're right and so and and the, what that does for the metabolism what that does for bone health what that does for so many of this body systems yeah. uh longevity wise and everything is got to be it that's where it takes over yeah. and it trumps, and you right? know what's interesting about it's this like too. if you were to put all three on a on a, on a graph yes. eventually exercise actually would 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 catch it and pass it yeah right? so what's interesting too about what i just said is i kind of create this false uh, presentation where they're all so separate and they don't uh, interfere or interact with each other. But the truth is, yeah. if you improve your sleep, you are more likely, the data shows us, you're more likely mm -hmm. to be active and more likely to make better food choices. If you're more active, you're more likely to get better sleep. You're more, act you're more likely to get better food choices. If you make better food choices, you're more likely to be active and more likely to get better sleep. So in other words, I just presented just for argument's sake, just to kind of illustrate how important sleep is. And if you want immediate 
results and impact, and you had to only pick one, pick that one. But the truth is, they're all so intertwined that uh, affecting one will affect the other ones. Well, and you really want to look at all of them. Of course. Isn't, isn't that sort of like parallel to what we're finding about like inflammation in the brain yeah. and how significant uh, that is now in terms of like uh, what you're eating and how that contributes towards it, you know, how you're moving. Uh, but, but sleep, obviously that's one of those that is the first sort of uh, like line of defense in terms of like being able to lower inflammation. Yeah. Well, you, you know, you know, it's funny too, is that people who, when they first have a baby, this is when they really like realize how big of a deal it could be like that, that sleep loss you get for some parents in that first, I don't know, definitely the first three months, but sometimes the first year or two, you talk to moms and dads who are doing that and they're just like, this is brutal. It's yeah. abs. You know that they do brain imaging on moms uh, and they, they lose brain volume. They actually mm. atrophy their brain. That's how wow. deadly and terrible this is over that initial period of time. So anybody who's had a kid will tell you if, if they have a tough sleeping kid or whatever, they'll tell you like, oh yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's torture. Does that recoup? Yeah, it eventually. Oh, yeah, okay. eventually. So I was but especially that would be, that would be <laughs> moms especially suffer because- their bodies get primed for hypervigilance um, in, in, in tune with the baby. Mm -hmm. So like a mom will tell you like, even yeah. like you, cause you, you'll hear people say who don't have kids, right? They'll be like, oh, when the baby sleeps, you go to sleep. When the baby takes a nap, you take a nap. It's like, I wish I could just fall asleep. It's like, I'm so exhausted, but I'm this hypervigilant state. It's hard for me to relax. Yeah. Whereas dad, Oh, baby's down. I'll just take a quick nap type of deal. It's so oh, every little sound, every I little know. groan, yep. every little thing means something different and triggers a response totally. to the mom. As a husband, it's one of the uh, most fascinating things I've seen it with motherhood, right? Firsthand now, like where there's been times I tend to fall asleep after Katrina. And so there's times where I'll be like laying in bed, laying in bed in thought, deep thought or whatever business stuff in my mind. And I'm laying there, it's pitch black in the room. She's out. I can hear her breathing. She's been asleep for 30 minutes. And all of a sudden, <laughs> she like sits up and she's like, I hear Max. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, no, you don't. I'm yeah, like, bro. and then all of a sudden, like, like 10 seconds later, you hear do, 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 like footsteps. And I'm just like, wow, how in the fuck I'm awake. I know. Right? right. And I'm silent. So it's not like I'm listening to something or whatever like that. I'm silent. It's so crazy, man. And she's dead asleep. Yeah. And then all of a sudden pops up. Here's something. No, you didn't. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I did. And then all of a sudden I hear the feet and I'm like, the fuck did you literally hear his head lift off the pillow? And that's what woke you up all the way in another room. Yeah. Like I've seen that. I happen mean, that's, that's multiple my, times. my youngest life, dude, like Courtney could just hear just little difference in breathing pattern or like a little bit of a, uh, you know, a noise that was like a wince, you know, and was like, Oh, something's wrong. You know, jumps out of bed, goes downstairs. Sure enough. He's like choking. I'm like, Oh my God. Oh, like, right. Yeah. Like it was, wow. that was like insane. It's like a superpower. That, it is. Yeah. It's crazy. It's I'll, almost like they're, they're connected on another well, they dimension. Were, bro. They bro. Were. Like, they're, like there's something yeah, else there besides they were. They're literally just, part of them that we don't, we don't get to, to experience that. Dude, I mean, that's I, the one thing I've expressed this to Jessica. There's a part of me that's envious because, uh, I mean, I have such a deep connection with my kids. I love them. They're, they're my life to me, but I don't think we can ever experience what, um, I mean, they were literally grew from them and a part of them right. connected, right? Mm -hmm. there, there's got to be a connection there that you don't think you could possibly understand unless you experience it. So there's a little envy sometimes. I'm like, man, I wonder what that would, like, what would that feel like to be that connected yeah. to your child? Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know? So what Scrapping I, a basketball to you doesn't have the same not effect. The same, no. So we, we know this, right? So what what's your theory then on like the research that shows like, um, like what happens to a, a kid without a father in their life? Like why, oh. why, why? So if they, if the, if the mom has such a crazy connection on yeah. this level that we all recognize and are, yeah. are borderline envious of, um, yet when you look at homes that grew up, like let's say you have, you, they've compared a home with a stable father, no mother around and what happens. And then a home with a, a mother and no father around. Why does the research seem to support uh, the, how detrimental it is to not have the father? What, yeah. What's your theory? So on? the data on uh, children that grow up without a father versus data on children who grow up without a mother, both of them don't do as well. Right. But without a father, um, they tend to perform much worse. Here's here's why. Uh, I think there's a bit of a self-selection bias. I think if you look at the data on who leaves, if someone's going to leave, 
ninety percent of the time or more, it's the guy. Yeah, like, when yeah, it's 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 crazy when a mom leaves. Yeah, like, there's so, a so lot of yeah, like like when you hear about that, like oh, he's a single dad. What do you what do you immediately think? Yeah. Oh, the mom died. There must be some like psychosis yeah. or something. Or she must have died, right? And they're like, yeah. no, no, she doesn't want to be a part of life. She bounced. Like that is crazy. Like nobody ever does that. No moms do that because it's so rare. So there's a bit of a self selection bias for the dads that stick around when moms yeah. are around. That uh, makes sense. You probably have a pretty fucking amazing dad. Yeah. Like I only know. And a very rare a case with a, with a mother who's Correct. Just, it's always like, they're always left behind. That makes sense. Yeah. Because, because that's what it didn't, that, I couldn't reconcile that. Right. Yeah. Like, because they, I, I know, <laughs> let's see. I know one case in my personal life of a dad who raised the kid because the mom was just absent yeah. and he is an exceptional father. Like very exceptional for, for the dad to stick around when the mom isn't. So I think that's where there's that bit yeah, of self-selection. I can think of one or two, but it was always, it was drugs. And it was like, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, where the mom was having, had the real big problem and just left and, you know, got consumed by drugs. Yeah. But, but I mean, again, the data shows the benefit of mom and dad providing different things, right? Dad. Yeah. Nothing trumps. Structure. I mean, you've shared this before on, on the podcast when you talk about all the things that we, I know we try and unfortunately in our society to divide by, uh, race and all and yeah. economics like nothing is the biggest factor of a kid's outcome of their level of success. Single parent household versus uh, dual parent household. Yeah, yep. doesn't matter. Does it's it the best matter. predictor. Yeah. yeah, for success, for education, for whether or not they're going to go to jail, be addicted to drugs. First of all, if you have kids, you know how hard it is to raise them with mm -hmm. a partner. Oh yeah, it's fucking hard. You're gonna mess you, up you need no matter a team. what. Team, yeah, I feel so bad. You know, what then you're by yourself, Single which parents. means you also have to work. Yeah. So like, okay, now you're not around your kids. Plus you got a job. Plus you probably have two jobs. You're more likely to be in poverty on top of it. Uh, boy, that's a tough, that's a tough gig. I mean, I, I, you know, my, we're lucky where my wife gets to stay home and be with the kids and still it's like, oh my God, this is so hard. Like yeah. to juggle all this. So, um, I can't, I can't even imagine, but yeah, I, it, th that connection, this is also why, I mean, we always took it for granted, right? Where, um, like if a, if a baby, when a baby's born and they remove the baby from the mom to go examine them or whatever, and that separation, like that's could be traumatic. You just could disconnected the baby from the mom and the baby now is not near the mom. I'm sure the baby's body knows. Yeah. I am not with my mom. I need to be with my mom. By the way, through like th for thousands of years, you know what that meant? Death. Yeah. Baby's born, not with mom, dead. Your food. Yeah. It's you know embedded I mean? in their DNA. Today's program giveaway is MAPS Aesthetic. Here's how you can enter to win. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comments section. We're also running a sale this month. MAPS Bands is half off and the Hard Gainer ban uh, Program Bundle is also half off. If you're interested in either one, just click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. Back to the sleep thing. Um, you know, not enough, not enough is, is uh, focus is put on that. Look, I a hundred percent admit this. I did not focus on sleep with clients until diet and exercise were dialed. I didn't even look at, first of all, I didn't even look at sleep for most of my career. Didn't even consider it. Yeah. When they tell me I got better sleep, I was like, oh, that's cool. But it was never like something I coached or trained or talked about until like maybe the last three you years. You bring it up like once in conversation when you're kind of getting like some inventory on how they're eating and like, you know, it, what they're doing outside the gym. But like, yeah, well, there was never any sort of like real focus or detail. Oh, it's crazy. You know, there's there's a huge hack to the insight in this, right? So one of the things, and I've shared this before, like Katrina always gets frustrated when <laughs> she sees how quick I shift my body composition, right? Like she'll, she'll feel like she's being so consistent with her training. Right, right. And she's like, man, I haven't seen you train in a few weeks. Then all of a sudden I see your, like literally your body change in like one week. It's, she's like, I just don't understand. And I'm like, well, of course I've been doing this for a long time. And I also know the the levers to pull. Yeah. And those are the three big ones. Like people think the, the default that people have is like hardcore diet. Or like lots of seven days a week of training. It's like no, like I move those three those three All levers three a little bit, just a little bit yeah. every single week. Mm -hmm. Like what I w I was paying no attention to sleep. Okay, I'm paying attention to sleep mm -hmm. now. I'm gonna get better sleep this week. I'm not trying to be perfect. I'm just trying to be better than what I was before I started doing this. My diet, I wasn't doing anything paying attention to diet. I'm paying attention. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm gonna hit my protein take. That's the first thing I'm doing. Training, I wasn't training at all. I just wanted to be sure I get about three days a week in this week, and then next week ramp up a tiny bit of intensity, get a little bit better at my sleep. You know, you know what I'm saying? And you just get a little bit better in the diet. And it's like every, it's like week over week over week over week, 
versus like throwing the whole kitchen sink at everything or only going double or triple down on one, but then the other two are out of whack. Yep. They work so synergistically that if you just move the needle a little bit in all three right. week over week, yeah. like you see this incredible change and it's like, that's, that's it. It's not about the, just the intensity in the workout. It's not just about being so strict on the diet. It's like, if I can improve those three levers just a little bit week over week, I'm going to move well, the needle. Or how about this? You got somebody who's training consistently four days a week, five days a week, whatever. Their diet's pretty good. They don't even pay attention to their sleep. And they're trying to squeeze out one more percent out of their workout with the next supplement or technique, or let me try this other little thing that I can do. Meanwhile, their sleep, they don't even pay attention to. Right. You know, their workouts, it's like they have like this thing they do an hour before, then a half hour before I take these supplements. Here's what I do intra set. Here's what I, here's my priming. Here's mm -hmm. what I do post. Here's what I make sure I feed myself afterwards to fuel myself. Here's the carbs and the proteins that I need for my whole, whatever, just, just, you know, surrounding this workout. But when they go to sleep, they don't pay attention to any of that. When all they, if all they did was left their workout alone, keep it the same, improve your sleep by 10%, your workout performance will go up by 15%. Mm -hmm. well, and then also your recovery which, That's what I mean. Everything. Which is all compounding. Which feeds back, yes. yeah. Yes, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, totally. Even the supplements around sleep are very interesting. The supplements around sleep are geared around insomniacs or people who are such an emergency mode, they just want to get knocked the fuck out. Like, mm -hmm. give me something just to knock yeah. me out. But there's not a lot of supplements out there just for helping you optimize sleep. Not ones that knock you out, but ones that just like, you know, I just want to improve the quality. Help you calm down. Yeah, right. get me better, you know, REM sleep. Like, there's a compound called lemon balm. This is one that that uh, that you can use that it's not like this crazy sedative. Like, you'll take it and, like, if you're an insomniac, you'll take it and then you'll go. To sleep. But it, if you sleep okay and you take it, studies show it, it can improve the quality of your sleep. It helps you sleep faster. Would you put that in the same categories like chamomile or something like that? Yeah. Okay. You know, things you can use all the time. So, like, Organifi is a product called... or. Um, called uh, gold juice. Gold juice, yeah. Gold juice has lemon balm, reishi in there, and other compounds that they're not going to knock you out. You're not going to drink gold juice and be like, oh my God, I can't drive. Like, I better go to sleep. It's not Ambien. Yeah, mm -hmm. or Tylenol PM. But, yeah, but but if you get, good, you know, your sleep is okay, you take it, you'll have better quality. Better quality. By the way, I want to tell you, this yeah. just reminded me, lemon balm and some of the ingredients in, uh, in Organifi, and I hope you're okay with me saying this, but mm -hmm. I know your son was having some night terrors. Yeah. They've been shown in studies to improve night terrors. And and uh, the gold juice is totally oh, wow. appropriate for kids. Like, yeah, nothing that's, wrong with taking that's it. great because, I mean, we're literally on every intervention we could possibly think of at this point. Uh, and it's it, it's at that point, too. It's like, well, I don't know. Maybe it's something psychological. Maybe we, you know, I we were trying to – everything we could think of physiologically, like, you know, maybe magnesium. Maybe, you know, we, it's what he's eating and his diet and this and Does that. Does anything help? Um, not, it, we've had like some success, like with, uh, some magnesium and mm -hmm. like some from, from med product, but, um, it, it just was very temporary. And then it's just kind of back to, back to this, this pattern that just keeps repeating itself. How and, consistent is it, Justin? You know, it's. Man, it's been like the past month. Is it every night? Every night. <gasps> every night for the past it, month? The only time he gets sleep is when like somebody's in the room with him. Oh. Um, and so he ends up like, and, and Courtney's been, it, it literally feels like we've regressed back to like when he's like an infant, you know? Wow, really? That bad again? Yeah, because so she'll, she'll go in and then like, you know, be a presence in there and like try to like soothe him and like, and then we'll, we'll I'm starting to like do shifts with her now. Uh, to, to try and like, you know, take some of that load off her plate uh, because it is like affecting both of us. And then like, we're like well, maybe because we have a king size bed, he can just kind of sneak in yeah. and we'll, and it's just like, it, it, you know, cause he, it's a kid, dude. He'll like thrash and all this. So yeah. I'm like not getting good sleep. She's not getting good sleep. And like, it's just been, it, it has been a problem. And it's like, I, I don't know if this is a phase of development. Like if, if like he's going through some kind of growth, uh, but yeah, like I'm definitely going to try this. Try the gold juice. And see if Plus it, it makes it good, end. So yeah. I like it. Yeah. You, have you ever been seen a night terror? Bro, my best friend's daughter. I remember the first time I saw I, it. As a parent, I, I feel so bad. King, I freaked out, dude. Like I didn't, like I've heard people say, throw that term around, 
But until you've actually seen, you can't do anything about it. You just have it. to sit there. It's like they're possessed. Yeah. It's like horror, and you yeah. and you cannot do anything. No, you, you can't gotta, you wake just, them up or shake you them. Just got to keep them from you, exactly. Themselves. You just exactly. You just like you like I watched my best friend. So we this was up actually at the Truckee house the first time I'd seen it, and uh, they had the camera on their daughter and stuff, and we're we're all out. It was like I don't know nine o'clock or so at night, and we're just kind of sitting around talking in the living room by a fire and stuff like that. And then all of a sudden, we heard her. And then they 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 ran upstairs to go go be with her, and so the, the I had the monitor down there, and I was watching, and the, literally my my best friend and his wife they just stand on each side of the bed and like corral, and they and I'm she's like she's just screaming, yeah, and she's just screaming and flailing and flipping. And How it, long did it last? It goes for like five minutes, dude. Yeah. Wow, like yeah. like literally five, maybe more, five ten minutes of like just straight no. He said some episodes, but it's not that. Oh, not that bad, thankfully. Bro, it did yeah, like rip my brutal. it ripped my it heart apart, long. dude. It, I had my nephew. My yeah. nephew would go long. Yeah, this, this was long. A, and my sister had to be with him for like 20, 30 minutes while yeah. he was freaking out. You yeah. know that you know the first time to see that because you don't know what the hell's going on. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Is he in pain? Is what he happened? Yeah. You're you know? just, and they're like, not and they're not alert. Loss. They're not like no. you're, you're, you're like t talking to uh -uh. them and they're not even responding. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, it's uh it's it was I'd never seen that. It's before. gotta be one of the worst things as a parent because oh. you literally can't do anything. And especially in the beginning when you don't know it's a night terror. You're thinking the worst. Like, what is happening? Is he in pain? Are they yeah. hurt? Like, what the hell's going on? So I feel, man, I feel for you. I, I try yeah. that. Yeah. I would try the gold juice, maybe some or maybe some chamomile an hour before that. And so you see. made like a tea. I remember one time we were up in Truckee and yeah. like you did a gold juice version that was like uh, almost like uh, warmed up, right? With just hot water. Yeah, no, no. So you could do almond. I mean, it was almond milk. milk that's I right. would do milk. And then you froth it. Yeah. yeah, I would froth it with the gold juice. And if you make it hot, you could throw a, a, a um, chamomile tea bag in there. Mm. Tad a little bit of uh, extra chamomile. And have him sip on it, you know. Yeah, because it was like forty five minutes before I'm bed. Like, I'm like, do we do melatonin? Like, you know, where like where's the list of like yeah. interventions at this point? Because we're just like, and thankfully he he hasn't done that at all when he stays at like his friend's house, and so he's been able to still go. Yeah, I don't know, man. It's that's why I'm like, it must be something psychological. So what? Yeah, so that okay, this is like super fascinating. You know, it's really interesting too. Like, obviously, you wouldn't do this with your kid. But I mean, if I had this issue, I would do it for as an adult. Um, I I've been now. It's been what a little over a month now. I'm going on I think five weeks uh, since I've had weed, and the dreams are insane. Super vivid, yeah, yeah, insane. I've had bad dreams now. I've, had, I've like I forgot what it was like to have that. I've used cannabis at night for so long mm -hmm. that it got rid of my dreams completely. So I I, I wonder. I mean, obviously, you're, I don't think you're going to get your kid high. <laughs> I'm like, what are you asking? How do you yeah. Off yeah. I know, but I mean, there's no. got to be something there, like the, that. Thanks, Dad. You, I mean, if you're having seizures, I would look into it. Of course, CBD. But, like, yeah, yeah, but no, I yeah. I, <sighs> do kids normally grow out of it? Is it yeah. like so? It's it's and that's it, what it, I've what, heard. So that's what, I'm kind of like holding on to that because it's it's like. You know, we're we're just trying to figure out like what's the best move. Like, what do we do? Like, do we do better job of like? And we've done stuff with, like lavender and like lotions yeah. and stuff, and like try to soothe and calm and like. So we'll get progress. Uh, sometimes we'll get a good night where it goes to like four in the morning, and then like, but then it happens. But that's like as long as it's been like. Usually now it's been less. It's like, you know, midnight. Boom. Like, does he go back? I to wonder. Sleep? I I no. wonder if no. um, what type of content that he's watching or seeing before heading into bed could have any sort of, of this of, is different than a nightmare. So yeah. a kid could wake up from a nightmare scared. Yeah. A night terror is a different. Oh, category. it is. It's a different category. Oh, so when, so when, the, when, when they all, when he becomes coherent and then you're talking to him, is he not able to communicate what he was seeing? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah, he's, he doesn't, he doesn't really even know. know. It's yeah. like sleepwalking. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's like sleepwalking. You ever watch yeah. sleepwalker? Yeah. My brother did that. It was really weird. Well, you know, it's actually my my best friend who has the daughter has this. He's has that that rare disease that that one comedian who did a a, oh. a thing where he like he acts out his dreams. Oh, he has yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. There's, there's got to be something in the gene, right? The fact that he has that, and then his daughter gets these night terrors. Of you would think there's got to be something in the, in the gene that like would express itself. Like That's that. the hardest thing as a parent is when there's something that you like can't really do anything about. Yeah. Yeah, like, what gotta, do I do? gotta ride it out. So I'm, yeah, I'm taking the things too. You know, I'm trying, to, <laughs> trying yeah. to intervene and get sleep where I Dude, can get it. Speaking of sleep, trip off this, right? So you guys know I moved because um, I don't know if I told the audience, but we we've been battling these like kind of mild autoimmune issues in my two and a half year olds, like skin issues, gut issues, 
couldn't really figure out what was going on. We're working with a functional medicine practitioner, did some testing. His gut was off, did some protocols there, you know, kind of got better. I'd have to manage his food, like going a low histamine diet. If you went off of it a little bit, he'd get these flare-ups. Couldn't figure out what was going on. Functional medicine practitioner was like, you know what? Let's test your guys' urine for mold because sometimes mold uh, in the house can cause something like that. So we said, okay. So he's, you know, in diapers. So we did the mold test and turned out we both had mold in our urine. So she said, okay, you need to get the house tested for mold. Now, first off, I don't know if you guys know this, but do you guys know how expensive like a legit mold test is for your house? Oh my God, how much? Yeah, we talked about this. Thousands and thousands, like $8,000. Yeah, of course. Okay, so it's like, okay, because they come in, it's very thorough. You get the general mold, like whatever, that's not going to do anything. They have to go in, they test the walls, the air, Mm -hmm. HVAC. Mm -hmm. It's like a whole day process then they send multiple sam- like all these samples to the lab type of deal so i said all right screw it we have mold in our urine let's just do this and see what happens anyway they came back and they're like yeah you got you got mold in the house it's throughout the whole hvac unit which means it was blowing all over us yikes and there were two types of mold that can cause problems now the problem with mold is a there's types of mold that are worse than others because you'll find mold in every house mm-hmm. so there's types you want to look out for and b it depends on the sensitivity of the individual, their body's ability to detoxify, et cetera, et cetera. But the fact that we found those two, that there were such high concentrations in the HVAC. It's enough to make you need like, to leave. Oh, yeah. I got to move, yeah. man. God, I hate moving, right? So uh, luckily that, you know, we sent the stuff to the, the landlord. Landlord's got to let us out of the lease. So we ended up moving and we're in a new place. And now the autoimmune stuff would probably take a month or two to notice any improvements. But here's a weird thing. My wife hasn't been able to sleep well for a long time, no matter what, whether she's, you know, I mean, I take over feeding the, the, the youngest because her sleep is so shit and it just, it's terrible. So, and I can typically fall back asleep, but even my sleep hasn't been the greatest, but whatever. Since we've been in the new place, we've been sleeping like rocks, like wow. rocks. Wow. Wow. You think so that, I'm like, you think that was disrupting the sleep that bad? I'm like, I, we were, I wonder how much we were affected by this mold and didn't realize it. Mm-hmm. And we still have yet to see the full effects because we've only been in this new place for less than a week. Well, if you it takes notice th- immediate effects like that, it takes crazy. three to six weeks for your body to clear things out. And you can speed up the process with like sauna, exercise, lots of fluids, that kind of stuff. Weird. Yeah. Now, now, knowing you, you went down the rabbit hole and, and Googled the shit out of everything. Yeah. So how common is this? Like in a house that's like, is there, have you looked up research or stuff that says like, oh, houses that are 30 years or older, it's 50% likely. If you see water damage or, or if you look, so the places to look, history of water damage. The places to look are under the sink in your cabinets. So if you look in the corners, like, is there water damage? Is there on the windowsills or in the showers and the bathrooms? If you notice any signs of water damage, you probably have mold in your house. Now, most houses have some kind of mold. It's just certain types you got to look out for. And then if you're sensitive, some people are very sensitive to mold. Yeah. So, and then I just learned this, strip off this. This fucking sucks. You, let's, say you, let's say you live in a house with mold. And you're like, oh, we found it. Move, move real quick. Get out of that house. Mold will follow you because it's in your mattress or your clothes. Then, so I've heard stories where people will move. Oh my God. The mold spores will be in their mattress. Yeah. And then like, you know, a year later, oh, I got mold in this place too. Dude. So what did so you- So I'm like, this better not happen to us. I was just saying, did you go out and we'll buy everything. a bunch of new mattresses then? We didn't, but we were, we're very clean. Everything's pretty, you know, whatever. We keep the house, you know, really dry. So I don't think that'll be an issue. And the house that we lived, that we moved in, that we lived in, excuse me, there were lots of signs of water damage. There were mm-hmm. definitely areas on the wood floor where I could tell- there was water damage yeah. and areas in the bathroom that we just ignored because it's, you know, whatever, older house or whatever. Dude, but. my old house, I guarantee we were, we had lots of exposure. I mean, I even uncovered it uh, downstairs because we had part of the, because we were on a slope mm. and this is a problem too. It's like, you know, towards the foundation, it was like the, the dirt was encroaching oh. uh, into basically the wall. And so it was like, anytime you get any contact with like dirt in your your walls uh, and siding or anything like that, the, all of that can foster mold, which then made its way in to the house. And I remember I was like, cause it was kind of rotting away and I, I cut back at it and then I found it wasn't black mold, but it was like not good mold. Mm-hmm. So I had to just clear the whole thing out thinking I got rid of it, but I'm sure it was like everywhere. Dude. I wonder what, I wonder what the percentage is. That's, I, a, that's there's no good data. At all. And the regulations around it suck because, again, a lot of it has to do with the sensitivity of the individual, 
the intensity or the amount of the mold, the fact that we had it in our urine, the fact that my son was having these issues, uh, and the, and the amount that we found and the types of amount we found, they were like, the guy that I talked to was like, look, I'm not supposed to, all I do is analyze the data. So I said, Hey, off the record, like, what would you do? He's like, I'd move. Same thing with the functional medicine, but it was Dr. Becky Campbell. She's yeah. like, yeah, I would get out for sure. Something oh, like wow. They both said that. Yeah. They're like, it's a lot. Oh, interesting. And it's in the HVAC, bro, which means it's in the. Yes. It's circulating. It's it like having, constantly. it's like having cancer. You have a tumor, but then now it's in all your lymph nodes. You know, it's everywhere. Right. So yeah. it's like, if it's in the HVAC, it's everywhere. Now the landlord's fucked because they have to go in and replace. It's going to cost them hundreds of thousands of dollars to do everything. Well, he hates you. Well, I mean, hey, <laughs> if I don't bring it to their attention, so you know what the deal is? Here's a, here's, they were and they were happy. They're like, we'll take, we'll give you your deposit back. Don't worry about anything. Leave the house as is, because it, it, with the with what we did, the tests, it, we if someone came back and said, oh, you got to pay for my hospital bills. I got missed work. You got to pay for my move. You got to pay for this. Yeah, they'd be fucked. But we're cool. We're like, look, you guys are nice people. We just want to leave. So uh, does that fall under the category? Like when you go to sell a house and they have to do a full inspection. So they don't like that? inspect for this kind of like that, not to this depth. I mean, so the move for him is to fucking sell his house. I mean, that's probably what he would do. Like, Maybe. Why, why, I mean, why spend hundreds yeah, of dollars? Yeah, but now that they have knowledge of this, that that now they're liable, right? If they didn't have knowledge of it, but now that they have knowledge, if they did that and someone You think so? It. If it's not part of the inspection process of a, of a house being sold? If why, someone well, if can now prove- it's on record. If yeah. someone can prove- Let's say they go through the right, not, not that someone would do this, but they go through the right. Why did you break the lease with this last uh, tenant? What happened? And let's say they interview me. I'm like, oh, there was mold. And then they find that they were aware, but they didn't tell the next person. They'd be screwed. Mm. Not that that would happen, but you know, but anyway, they're, they're really honest people. They're good people. They're on, I don't think they would do something so they're like probably that. probably going to have to pay for it to get it fixed. Yeah. They're, they're really good people. I don't think they I would I mean, you got to go in and probably gut the whole thing. I mean, yep. that's, yeah. Oh, yep. yeah. All yep. the way to the studs, man. Yep. So that's now we're in the whole movie, which I hate. I hate. Now, luckily for me, my wife is like a moving, she's like a superhero when it comes to, now she moved a bazillion times as a kid. Like yeah, they moved so many times. And then as an adult, she traveled, traveler, she yeah. traveled with the circus. So for her, she's like so good at it and it's still stressful, but she like actually enjoys some of it, which is really strange. I lived in two houses my whole life until I moved out and I hate moving. I can't stand it. It's the most disruptive thing in the world. Yeah. I don't even want to be around mm, when it's same. happening. So, so luckily for her, she, you know, it's all getting handled and, you know, plus you know, I can handle paying for people to do half the shit that I don't want to do. <laughs> you know, that's why I haven't called you guys. Hey, you yeah. guys want to come over for pizza and beer? You know what's happening. Oh yeah. Yikes. Oh yeah. Why? What's going on? Uh, first of all, I'd be like, this isn't Sal because he can't have gluten. Yeah. And, uh, or dairy. Also, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a trick. This is a total trick. It's yeah. There's a trick like, here for sure. I'm trying to sell us something. I know. Oh, uh, did you guys? See, so okay. You know, through this this whole like 2020 crazy stuff, they start canceling everything, right? Uh, in terms of like naming of, of things like, uh, uh, you know, Aunt Jemima and like everything else across the board. Oh, yeah. So even like the, the Washington uh, Redskins changed their oh, name. Oh, I know what you're going to bring up right and now. And they became the Commanders. Karma. And, dude, check this out. What? So there's a group, uh, <laughs> Native so American great. Association group, that is literally suing <laughs> them <laughs> for why change, for changing for changing it. the name <laughs> because they're like dude this is not only uh this was this was like an iconic uh like heroic uh, representation we're getting representation this way that's what's so great is when you have a bunch of karens that get so loud about some bullshit that the people that it's supposedly offending actually appreciate it and liked it they love and now it. they're fucking suing them for changing wow. it. yeah and also I love too, it i love the, it the logo of the uh the chief yeah it, that's a real person like uh, that they modeled it after apparently like chief white calf, I believe. Uh, but there's this whole history. You know what I think behind it? I think, I think that this, that people talk about like white supremacy. I think the real, like under the, like the real people pulling the strings are the ones that make you think you're doing good things. when in reality, they're pulling out your representation and Jemima racist, pull her out. This person, right? Pull it out. Now nobody exists yeah. in media to represent these, the, the, you know, these things, which by the way, these are like historical companies that were owned by these people. Like, it's crazy. Yeah. So yeah. now they get sued for it. Yes, I know. Sued. I thought that was so great, though. Such Poetic good. justice, bro. Yes. I think that's so great because I think that was such a stupid I hope they thing win. They better, yeah. You'll never hear Italians complain about Super Mario. 
Yeah, yeah, or Irish, the fighting Irish, and like all the, uh, you know. And when you think about Super Mario, it's about as racist as it gets, bro. Hella racist, bro. You got a mustache, you're a plumber. Yes, dude. Little short guy. Well, well, here's the thing. (laughs) You know how that came about, right? That was his actual. uh, It's based off a real person, too. Yeah, yeah, it's based off a real person. He actually allowed them to use his. his, uh, not factory. What's it called? Like a like a storage shed. Oh, to, yeah. For the first uh, for the first yeah uh, development development of of yeah Nintendo. And it so, was the landlord, the landlord, and he, and he let them off because they couldn't pay rent. And he said that's fine. That's what it here. was. Yeah. yeah. So they named the they named the, the character after him called right. Super Mario. Mario. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a perfect example though of that. I mean, someone could totally try and spin that on this. It's this massively racist. But yet, it also represents somebody. And if I was that guy, I wouldn't want you. Like that was like made after me. I don't care if you have you ever watched the videos. There's this dude. There's this guy that goes. He wears like cultural appropriation outfits, right? So like a traditional like Uh, you know you know like uh, you know Chinese outfit, or or like a huge sombrero or something. And then he goes to communities. Like he'll wear the sombrero and the whole deal. He'll go to a Hispanic community. Oh, I think I see. And he'll interview on, them on Prager U. They've yeah, and he'll right? interview them. What yeah. do you think about this? I'm like, oh, I love it. I love it. You don't think I'm like, you know, no, 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 it's great. You know, or he'll go to like these. You it's know, all the college kids and yeah, the, dude. the Karens that like, yeah, they flip their lid. Yeah, they, like, they all oh, love it. Like, this is great. I love your outfit. You know, so dumb, he's like, you don't, dude. you don't think it's appropriation? Like, I saw that? that same news, Justin. I got excited when I thought, <laughs> yeah. that's so, so good. It's like, oh, get him. Yeah, that's funny. I think it's hilarious. Yeah, commanders are lame, dude. Like, such a, it's such a stupid name. Hey, did I tell you? Did, did I, I don't think I brought this up. Let me see if I can find the article. Did you know that they genetically modified uh, silkworms? Let me read this. This is mm. crazy. Wait. Scientists have synthesized spider silk yeah. from genetically modified silkworms, producing fibers six times tougher than the Kevlar used in bulletproof vest. Wow. Yeah. So they, the, they've done this with goats too. Yeah. So what's cool about this, because because you know silkworms can produce way more of this fiber than the spiders can. So they literally modified silkworms to make spider fiber or it's, spider silk. Wild. Yeah, to be able to and produce it's this. even stronger because of that that cross genetic like uh, <sighs> yeah. It's somehow like the fiber got stronger. That's as a fascinating. Dude. It is, dude. Yeah. But you know, it's funny that this the science exists. What are they doing that we don't know about? I know. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, uh, UFOs and things yeah. that are I mean, popping I, that's up. I'm on the same page like with you. Super that. soldiers. Yeah, like yeah. they're already they're figuring it out, like right before our eyes. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Like super intelligent, like monkeys or something. You know, like well, yeah, well, you saw warriors. that. Yeah, where they're they're um they were they had like those embryos that were like half human, half uh monkey. chimera. Yeah, the chimeras. Yeah, I know. Doug, what what is the what is the imagery? You just oh, I got to show you guys this. So check this out. So this woman took these photos of herself and then used AI to present the representation of what was considered the ideal female body During- through the <laughs> through the centuries and decades. Oh wow, this 14 is great. To so the first the first one, fourteen hundreds to seventeen. This is a base, this is all based off of media. Yeah, so fourteen to seventeen hundreds, like it was it was pictures, right? Yeah. And it says the perfect body back then was full and curvy. Then you got to the 1920s, which was this boyish, you know, the flapper girl, like kind of look. Then you got to the 1950s, maybe Doug scroll down, and it was kind of the hourglass look. And then the 1990s yeah. so with- the 50s are the best. 50s, was, that's awesome. Yeah, super skinny. And then moving forward, uh, 1990s to the 2000s was big boobs, long yeah, legs. Yeah, yeah. So you know what's interesting about this? Because you, you see like what's considered the perfect- Female body. 2010s so, would be just all booty. I yeah, so it's like yeah. so dramatically different, right? Like the, the one from the 1400s, 1700s, that's like she's a good 50 pounds heavier than the one from the 90s or something like that, right? Yeah. So what could they possibly have in common? Is there any real evolution, evolutionary root or is all media driven? So scientists went around the world studying what was considered the perfect ideal female physique and they found these huge varieties or variances some cultures liked them heavier the consistency cultures, in the hip to waist ratio hip to waist ratio yeah was that was that was consistent right? consistent across the board yeah. and even with this if they were actually to, to do the math and look at the hip to waist ratio you'd find there's this ratio that scientists found regardless of the size of a woman uh from culture to culture and that ratio very strongly correlated to successful childbirth Mm-hmm. Now that crazy. okay, so I obviously we I'm familiar with that and uh, agree with that, but that doesn't highlight that. No, this, that this actually, is her using AI, so I think she's just trying to illustrate it. But when you actually look at 
and they measure models and all that stuff, there's this ratio that seems to always come up. I mean, I feel like we were onto it in the 50s. Yeah, right. I, you know, away from the ideal. I, you know, I, of all those I physiques agree. that she's presenting, right? I think that, in my opinion, the fifties looks the best, the healthiest, and most natural. She's just natural. She's a little bit thicker. Like, I mean, yeah, totally. I don't even mind the fourteen to seventeen hundred uh, one. I that one looks more natural. Nineteen nineties yeah. one, that like, there's, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. It, kind of, it looks unhealthy, right? Like it could totally Very be thin. unhealthy. Well, that that. I mean that you saw that a lot in models, uh, in runway models, and yeah. like you know how Heroine the, the supermodel. Thing. There was some like a show coming out with like the the supermodels of you know that's like not really a thing anymore. That used to be a huge like when we grew up. Have you ever seen a supermodel in person? By the way, Have you ever seen actually an actual supermodel? No, never. In person? Uh -uh. So it's almost like when you see like a a bodybuilder or something in person. It's it's the proportions don't make sense. Supermodels, they look like aliens. Uh, yeah, I've their seen bodies somebody, don't make sense. Yeah, I've seen somebody that's like uh, on Instagram that uh, you know has real crazy features, and then you see them in real life, and yeah, it, it was really hard like, to like look at them. Yeah, supermodels, like, they're tall, their legs are really long. You look at them, they're like aliens. Like there's they, they, their body, their proportions do not represent even the slightest of what the normal person looks like. Not even close. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah. Anyway, so um, uh, I want to talk about Viore. We're supposed to mention them, but. Um, I consistently, consistently get comments on Viore. And by the way, that's the only thing I wear now. I don't, I'm not like a style person. So I'm very happy that we work with a company that can provide me with things that look good. Consistently, people will comment on the stuff that I wear. Like yeah. family members. It's people getting cold. So I'm like, the last last season, they did two different um, flannels. And I was so happy that yeah. they finally like rolled those out. I'm like, I'm crossing my fingers to see if they but the, keep that up. The comments used to be, what are you wearing? Now people are coming up to me like, oh, you got Viore on. I like, they can recognize that. It's oh, it's uh, the brand's everywhere. I see it all the time now. Like I, I, I used to think like when I saw it, like oh, they maybe they listen to Mind Puff, right? Because we were like their original <laughs> yeah. advertisers, right? I no longer think that. I mean, it's the brand is so big now that it, most people I see that wear athleisure wear, most people are especially guys now because I think it. Lulu was always the girls like yeah. athleisure yeah. wear, right? That was the brand for the for the longest time, and then they really made a mark. And I think in the male market, of course, they've now they see a lot of girls wearing it too. But now, if I see a guy that wears athleisure wear, I, I would actually say seven out of ten times. It's, High likelihood it's, it's Viore. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. You, know, you know, my favorite, uh, so I just bought this for Courtney, is, and because we, I'm trying to promote us, like, uh, learning tennis together, and so we're just, like, practicing. I got, like rackets and there's uh at the high school we can go down and just kind of oh, just cool. just to move and do something you know together that's a little different and so they have like these like amazing skirts that from viore like <laughs> and i was like and i have like she's like gives me the highbrow like what are you doing <laughs> and i know what i'm doing yeah. i'm trying to enjoy my time playing tennis with you yeah, but well. you want to be fast right <laughs> just yeah. wear the skirt you yeah. don't want anything else it's aerodynamic it's, yeah it's slowing for you sports down. performance yeah you know? hey tennis skirts are hot dude that's yeah, a good call that's a, that's a good call there yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> for a second i thought justin was hey we have me. uh yeah. mike we're gonna get the chance to talk to mike I'm super, we do so uh, michael Chernow from creatures of habit we're gonna talk to him about this uh, new exciting release. But before we do, should we do our shout out before we do? Yes. Okay. Okay. I'm excited about this shout out because I think this, someone asked the other day, um, you know, who are like the most famous people that listen to Mind Pump? And we were talking about um, the F1 you know, racer for our, Carlos, um, for Ferrari, yeah, Carlos. We're talking about uh, Russell Dickerson, the country singer. Um, I forget who else we were talking about that were some big names. This has to be probably one of the most famous people I think that listen to Mind Pump now, which is Roman Reigns, who is like the man in WWE. Right? Oh, yeah. yeah. I'd yeah. say he's, he's like, like the, the next rock, right? Yeah. He's like yeah. the the rock of this generation that's up and coming. And so I'm and I'm sure anybody who watches I'd love to have him on the show. Yeah. I so, would love it. Well I found out I found out yeah, literally last night I had somebody DM me and who obviously is a fan of wrestling. I was like, oh my God. And they had screenshotted uh, him following. And so I DM'd him from the Mind Hub Media page in, last night. So we'll see uh, about getting him on the show. I think that would be a, a super fascinating person to talk to. But that was pretty, I thought that was pretty cool. Bro, I'm, I'm so excited to have you on here to talk about this collab. You and I have been talking. How long has it been in the works? I mean, I remember. Almost a year. It has been almost yeah. a year. And the, the cool part about this collab, at least for me, is that before we ever met and I was in the competing space, uh, this was a staple meal for me. Every, this is long before you and I met. I used to make 
my own oatmeal. So of course, when we hit it off, we met, I loved your product to start with. And the one thing that was missing for me was like, dude, I had a go-to blend that I used to make myself every single morning and you didn't have that flavor. So I'm super excited. So tell the audience uh, how this came to, came about. Tell me about the flavor, uh, the whole experience for you too, putting it together. Yeah, well, I, I mean, first of all, I wanted to get on your show, right? I wanted to get on your show. So, so as soon as I showed up, um, the first person I met was Sal. We connected, and then I met Adam, and then we connected. And I think we probably we spoke for a long time before we even started rolling the camera. And I just had a connection to you guys, and I knew that they, that we were going to build like an awesome partnership and, and and a relationship. And um, and so you know, we we I, I think when we saw what happened to creatures of habit, when I, when that, my episode went live, I immediately reached out and said, Hey guys, this is kind of crazy. What, what, what just happened to my company? Um, I think that the, the, the audience that listens to mind pump, I mean, I listen to mind pump. I've been listening to mind pump for a long time. Yeah. Uh, the audience that listens to mind pump is, is, is people like me, right. Who really give a shit about what we put into our body, what we do with our body. And you guys are at the helm of this movement of sharing real, real great information. And it's obvious that your audience resonated with what we're doing at Creatures of Habit. And so I was like, how do we figure something out here? Like, how can we figure it out? And um, and so we worked out a, a deal between you guys and I, and, and we started working with you guys on the podcast. You guys are now investors in the brand, which is amazing. And uh, and then I was like, hey, like, let's do, let's do a collaboration. Um, on a flavor. We've never done a collaboration on a flavor before. If there's anybody to do it with. It's obviously you guys. And I think Adam kind of just threw everybody else to the side and said, <laughs> I'm fucking doing this. Yeah. I'm, t- I'm, I'm, I'm going to take the reins here. And Adam and I started going back and forth on what flavor profiles. And then you mentioned the strawberry, like strawberry was your jam. And I was like, we, we don't have a strawberry. I've wanted to do a strawberry. And you were like, yeah, but what about, what about walnuts and cream? And I was like, let's go and so we started we started uh we started iterating and i don't know how many flavor how many different different samples do we taste 10 four, 15 four or five i versions? actually well you narrowed it down, you did that and then you narrowed down to i think four or five that you sent to us to taste and then we picked that yeah. one and then we had our, our staff the best tasting one, yeah, yeah our staff all go through it and it was uh it was like clear it this was, was very clear yeah. i mean you guys shot down my pizza flavored idea so <laughs> <laughs> we went with the strawberry walnut cream i wanted an all cheese one and it yeah. didn't work out <laughs> yeah, so nobody so wants fucking pizza for breakfast <laughs> <laughs> well they do but not pizza so the, like the coolest thing about this is that like you know strawberry like sh- strawberry oatmeal is is a thing right it's been a thing forever it's like a classic it's a classic i believe quaker oatmeal flavor it is um, strawberries and cream and when you see any sort of oatmeal brands there's always some sort of a strawberry and cream being that we are a plant-based meal one is a plant-based product we're not a plant-based company but meal one is a plant-based product um I decided to to use coconut cream, which added such a really nice roundness to the to the flavor profile. So like tradition, you know, strawberries are are like could very well be the perfect fruit because they're sweet and they're tart. And the balance is like it's hard to beat. It's hard to beat. Like there's I love apples, but you know, like there's not a perfect apple. A strawberry is like a is like a perfect fruit. It's just so delicious. I don't know anybody who doesn't love strawberries. So you take strawberries, you got this perfect balance of of sweet and tart, and then you round it out with this coconut cream, and then you add the texture with the crunchy walnuts and and a little bit of earthiness, a little bit of fat to it. It's just like a match made in heaven. It's really the 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 way the flavor came out. I'm super stoked and fired up. I actually I, I've co- I've cooked up my own little version here, and I'm gonna I'm gonna eat it while we talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, you do Your a good audience job, man. Can, can not only hear. But also see how delicious it is. It's <laughs> good stuff. I'm excited, dude. I, I, I you know, uh, this is something that, like, I, when I made my own oatmeal, like all the flavors that you you already currently have, and all the basic combinations, I've had that. Like, that's you know, when you do when you're eating oatmeal every single day for years, you start to mess around with flavors and. This was just my go-to. It was the flavor that I always loved to make. And so having you not have it in your lineup was like, dude, we have to do this. So, and I can't wait to hear the audience's feedback because so far, every, I mean, most of our audience has absolutely loved meal one. And so bringing my flavor is like, I can't wait to see the response. I hope we blow it out the way. I hope you sell out. I mean, that's what I hope. I hope that you're, you're, you can't supply 
enough of this stuff. So I hope you stocked up, bro. Well, I got to tell you, man, like my lucky number is seven. And this just so happens to be our seventh flavor. Let's go. Um, I think we will definitely sell out of the flavor without a question of a doubt, especially after this episode goes live. Um, but, but for anybody who doesn't know what meal one is, just to give you a quick recap, if you listen to Mind Pump, chances are you know because the guys talk about it a lot. But if you don't, it's not just oatmeal. It is, it's a super high protein overnight oatmeal. You can have it hot. You can make it into a smoothie, but it's best served overnight. It's got 30 grams of plant-based protein. It's got omega-3 fatty acids. It's got a probiotic, digestive enzymes. It's got some pink Himalayan salt for a pretty healthy dose of electrolytes. And it's delicious. And it's super, super simple. It takes 30 seconds to make, literally 30 seconds to make. Like you can make five meals for the week, which is what I do on Sundays. I make my my meal one, I make it five in five different containers. It takes me about three minutes to make five meals and I'm done for my first meal of the day for that for, for Monday through Friday, every single week I make it. It takes me three minutes to make, it's incredible. So I think that's why they, why you know you guys gravitated towards it as well because it's it's an easy way to get 30 grams of protein in the morning without thinking at all. Yep. Like, yep. It's just like convenient. without thinking. hundred percent. If you win the morning, the, the day becomes a lot easier that we just learned that as trainers. So yep. great job, dude. Yeah. Great job, man. Yeah. Awesome Excited. product, man. It's officially live now, right? So audience can go to, go to the website and get it, get it while it lasts. That's it. Get it while it lasts. Yeah. It's here. It's delicious. I think anybody, um, Everybody's going to love it. So it's definitely going to be a great addition. We haven't dropped the flavor in about a year. So this will this is this is a big one for us and and to be in collaboration with you guys on it is a really really big deal. Yeah, I'm excited. Yeah. Keep us Guys, please. if you're listening, strawberry walnut cream. This is uh this is coming from Adam Schaefer's palate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, creatures of habit. Hey, the dream. Creaturesofhabit.com forward slash and cream. Forward slash mind pump. The code is mind pump and it's uh twenty percent off. Sorry. MP25. MP25, sorry. MP25 for twenty five percent off. That's the biggest discount that's available from Creatures of Habit. I know we had to get you in an, an arm lock and have you uh, uh, you know give us that, but we got it. Twenty five percent off for our audience only. Check it out. Love you guys. Appreciate you guys. Thank you so, so much. Thanks, brother. Keep Love you too, it. bro. Have Keep a good it. one. Sleep is extremely important, and there are things you can take to improve the quality of your sleep. They don't knock you out. They don't make you drowsy, but they actually improve the quality of your sleep. Well, there's a company that has something called the Pre-Bed Drink. It's called Sleep Breakthrough, and it has compounds to improve the quality of your sleep, all backed by data. Go check them out. Go to sleepbreakthrough.com forward slash mind pump. Use the code mindpump10. For a discount. All right, back to the show. First question is from Guy Pettigrew. I've seen a lot of content trash talking renegade rows. People say to either do a row or a push up slash plank. What is the value in including them in a workout? Yeah, people who trash exercises, <laughs> unless there's context, like if they're saying uh, renegade row is not a great for this. muscle builder for the back uh, in comparison to traditional rows. Or yeah, whatever. I would agree. With that. I could right. say that. Yeah. But renegade rows have their own value. A renegade row, yes, you're working the back. Yes, you're working it's the core. Anti-rotation. Anti-rotation. It's a. It's one of the best anti-rotation exercises to create stability in the lower spine, in the spine, to prevent torsion or twisting with certain athletic well, endeavors. I think that's that's probably why it's it's they're they're highlighting it as a worthless exercise because people don't like see it like that. Yeah, right? like they're they're looking at it as a a more challenging way to do a row, which right. you know, the real value of it is to be able to focus and brace and, and make sure that your hips and your body doesn't rotate while you're pulling off the ground. And, and so it, it is a bit challenging in that regard. And there's value there. I mean, context matters. Totally. I just, it, you can, you can make the case that every exercise is shitty for something Right? I, can, right, I can give me an exercise, I'll, and then I'll tell you what a lot of people generalize it as, and then I'll make a point that oh, that's shitty for this though. Mm -hmm. So if someone said renegade rows are are, I mean, they're terrible for your calves. You know, it's not a great exercise for your calves, so mm -hmm. they're terrible for that. Right? They're not the best for back hypertrophy, but they they have a place, and they're, so they're and they're incredible for what they're used for. So I think it's so funny when, I mean, this is just the clickbait social media culture is find something that's maybe popular or someone's using and then make a video about it. And then it's now, I blame part of it though. I do blame on the fitness influencers who have zero <coughs> understanding of workout yeah. programming Yeah, that too. and they throw renegade rows into a workout. It's typically like the 
the fat loss burning workouts for girls. It's typically what for women, right? That's typically what they'll include Renegade Rosen. Why? Because they look hard. Mm -hmm. They look different. That's a good point, Sal. Like, uh, I okay, there's there's a place where they are terrible. Like, uh, you know, you, they don't even know why they're using it. Yeah, you yeah. see people throw it in a circuit because they're challenging because yeah. it's gonna make you sweat and burn a bunch of calories yeah. and program that way is is a terrible way to use them. It's just not ideal for it. But if your desired outcome is to uh, work on stability and anti rotation. Uh, it's a great exercise and tool to include into your programming. So it really depends on who's who's writing it and what they're promoting it for on whether it's a shitty exercise yeah. or now, not. Now, just for people who are listening, like what's anti-rotation? Anti-rotation is the ability of your core in particular to prevent too much rotation or torsion or twist. So uh, how would this work? Well, let, let's just give you an example. This is silly, but let's say you're walking and someone shoulder bumps you, Okay. If you didn't have good anti-rotation, your upper body would twist off your body and you'd hurt your low back, right? Anti-rotation prevents you from twisting so much that you hurt your low back. Now apply that to performance, running, hitting a baseball, throwing yeah. something, uh, you know, throwing a punch, a kick, whatever. It increases your ability to control your body. That's right, because because that will limit your ability to generate force. Your ability to control excessive rotation actually is one of the main limiters on your ability to generate force. So this is very important for athletics and performance. Not only that, it's also just for, for protection. I can't tell you how many times I've had a strong client who can deadlift 300 plus pounds or squat 200 plus pounds and throw their back out rotating and pulling a, a weed out or picking yeah. their shampoo bottle up off the floor or reaching back to grab to feed their kid in the back seat and just rotating like that because they just have no control strength or stability in that movement yep. and they throw their back out and that they, they're they're buff they're strong or they're fit but they have they they put no effort into rotational or anti-rotational movements and so it's a, it's has its place just you have to know why why you're doing it next question is from Megan Wyant are dumpy squats a good warm up for barbell squats if you're trying towards greater range of motion in the barbell squat? Absolutely. Yeah, that's what they're best for. Absolutely. Really. So, so here's how dumpy squats work. They're kind of hard to, to describe, but what's happening when you do a dumpy squat is you're really activating your CNS to it, it closer to its full capacity. So let's say you have an issue with hitting a full range of motion squat. There's mobility issues. One way around that is to create the create stability, thus making your body feel safer going in a deeper position by activating your central nervous system. So what's happening by I'm holding a stick, I'm pressing it in, into the floor, mm -hmm. I'm generating force, slowly going down. That creates a type of stability because the CMS is- Protective signal. That's right. So my body then says, okay, we can go deeper. Mm -hmm. We'll allow you to go deeper. So you can test this out. I can only go so deep with a body weight squat, but if I do a dumpy squat, all of a sudden I can go deeper. This is because your body feels safer. Now that new range of motion can be trained later with a barbell squat, and now you can strengthen that range of motion. So as a primer, mm -hmm. I think it's a phenomenal exercise. It's great because it's a tool. Like I mean, you could do this by just tensing your body and going into like a kind of a tension squat, but uh, to have this as like a prop to then you know be able to direct um, and push and, and press it. It just promotes that, that natural response that your muscles want to, to engage and contract. And so having that constant contraction while also like moving into depth in your squat, you realize how much safety and, and, and control you have once your muscles are tense like that. It's actually like, it's a good concept to wrap your head around and like go through that process. Because I think a lot of people, uh, it, it, it's counter to how they would, would approach flexibility in general, right? That's is, right. Is, you know, they think you have to be loose and you have to be able to get to a certain, uh, position and then create tension. No, have that that tension constant. So it, your body feels like it's, it's protective and allows you to go uh, even further. And it, wasn't it named after your buddy? Yeah. So Dennis Dumphy. So this is, he literally came up with this concept as he was going through stick mobility and came up with a lot of concepts there that they now uh, have as a full modality they created. But I was there in the gym while he was messing around with these concepts. And then I did it with him and was like, wow, there's so much value to this. And I started using it with my clients as a, as a teaching tool uh, and to prime for squats. And really, because you know how clients, they'll, they'll attempt like a barbell squat and you can just see like, I'm like, brace, brace, brace. And to get them to understand the concept yeah. of like maintaining that, 
uh, is challenging. And so this was an easy way to yeah. promote that. Yeah. If you're just listening to the podcast, you can literally type in uh dumpy mind pump, dumpy squat on YouTube and you'll get a good, uh, and spell dumpy for the audience. D U N P H Y. Next question is from Pete Kendrick one is maps primed designed as an actual program or is it designed as a guide to improve mobility and get you ready for your workout? Okay. So mostly the second part. However, we did put a basic correctional exercise workout in there for people who are beginners and just trying to work through issues with range of motion, pain, stiffness, um, just general issues with muscle imbalances. So in maps prime, it's specifically for helping you prime yourself for your workouts and it's designed around your body. So there's a compass test you take and it directs you for what you need as an individual, but there are, there is a workout in there for each of the challenges that you can follow in lieu of another maps program, another workout program that is really just purely designed to help correct yeah, those issues. It, it kind of uh, depends on the severity, I guess, of it's the ultimate the regression function. Yeah. yeah. If yeah, you, you, if you had somebody who was just, riddled with chronic pain and you know every or you're just a total beginner i would even say right yeah but i i feel like because even then i would still probably direct somebody in map starter yeah, right, and right. go that way yeah it's really somebody who's just like riddled with with chronic pain that like all basic exercises and movements bother yeah. them and they can't perform them very They're well super restricted they can't move yeah very and far. so i'm like you know what we don't even need to really be doing any major like exercises what we need to be doing is trying to correct all these imbalances and get you moving uh properly that's the ultimate regret Aggression. Most people you're not going to have to do that with, but we designed it so you have that as a, as a coach or a trainer or somebody to assess themselves and do that. The, the most popular way to use it, or I think the best way to describe it is every, every good coach and trainer, I don't know anybody who doesn't do this, the very first session that you meet a client, the very first thing you do before you do anything, before you program or tell them what program to do or exercise them in the gym you do an assessment on them, right? Like that, that a good coach and trainer is going to do a full assessment. We designed that assessment based off of the three of us coming together on what we thought are some of the most important things that you need to look at and see before you take them through any exercises. That's why it's, we broke it up. And we try to also not overcomplicate this because there's some really good assessments out there, but they're really, really overcomplicated. It's super comprehensive. Yeah. Really. For the average person. You'd to, want training. In it, in yeah. So it. we thought, what can we do that, uh, that one is going to be an incredible tool for coaches and trainers, but then also be for the average person like that they could just point out like, okay, did I pass? Did I fail? Zone one, zone two, zone three. If I failed, what are good movements for me to do, to do so I could later on be able to pass zone three? And so that was the concept of that and that you should take every person and every person listening, if you follow MAPS programs, should have that to assess themselves so they know best how to prime their broad, their body before they go into every workout. Next question is from Hoop Golf 89 What are the best calorie-dense foods for bulking for a hard gainer without being too unhealthy? Oh, I love this question. This is my favorite. One of my favorite questions because they're whole, they're natural, and they're inexpensive. Uh, I'll, I'll start with, I'll, I'll go with the proteins, right? Whole eggs, ground beef, 80%, whole milk, chicken thighs, those right there are all pretty inexpensive sources of, of good quality, whole natural food protein. Carbohydrates, white rice, potato, oatmeal, grits. Like those are all really good sources of dense yeah. carbohydrates. Frozen vegetables. Organ meat if you can handle it. Yeah, frozen, <laughs> frozen vegetables are great. And then you can throw in fruit if you want. Berries are phenomenal for the fiber. I mean, you're set. It's not that expensive I would to add, bulk properly. Yeah, I would, all that. And I would add olive oil and uh, avocados. Yeah, there you go. Other than that, like I think Butter. that um, the, the biggest thing when you're trying to bulk the, or the biggest mistake that I see people make when they're trying to bulk and they know they need to get a lot of calories is they take the, they chase the calories first before their protein. So my recommendation is to like go get the protein right. for sure first, and then it's not that hard to get the, these dense calories. I mean, you if you use olive oil on all your vegetables, you use that in when you're cooking your meat and stuff like that. You do things like chicken thighs or ground beef instead of like chicken breast or lean fish. Yep. Like if you make those types of choices, like the calories are going to come pretty quick. You'd be surprised by doing that, but don't make the mistake of chasing calories so hard 
that you you go you go high enough on calories and but you get it in processed foods and garbage and you miss your protein intake. Get your protein intake. You just get fat. Yeah, and utilize things like healthy fats, like the olive oils, like the avocados, things like that. I, even cheese. I think if you don't have an intolerance to 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 cheese, I think that's a great way that makes the food more. Fl- I love avocado and cheese and olive oil are easy ways to make every meal taste a little bit better and boost the calories. Here was my, here was my number one bulking meal when I was younger. Hmm. That was inexpensive. I would go ground beef, rice, or potato, frozen vegetables. And then I'd throw salsa and avocado on it. And it was like high calorie, high protein, yeah. Everything I need, and it tastes great. It and was, you're, and it, something to add to that, I feel like that meal, it's one of my favorite go-tos also. Your body assimilates it so fast, easy. you can eat again. Yeah. Which is also, by the way, a, a secret to being able to eat enough food and meals to bulk properly is not eating these, the, again, these highly processed yeah. you don't or get all high, high and, saturated yeah. fat foods, and then your body is just working to digest yeah. it, and then you're full. Like Anybody who's ever experienced this who's trying to bulk, where you're like, yeah, like oh, a big bowl of pasta. Yeah, I go, or I go yeah. have McDonald's. I go eat this huge 1,500-calorie meal, but then I don't want to eat for like six hours because I'm like, my body is working to digest it. Let alone work out. Where I'll yeah. be able to go ground beef, avocado, rice, shit, I'll eat three of those meals in the same amount of time, mm-hmm. and then it'll end up being the same amount of calories but very nutrient dense and way better for your body than, you know, a bunch of processed crap from McDonald's. Totally. Look, if you like the show, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out all of our free fitness and health guides. They're free. You can get all of them. You can also find all of us on social media. Justin is on Instagram at mindpumpjustin. I'm on Instagram at mindpumpdestefano. And Adam is on Instagram at mindpumpadam.